Hello, and welcome to my channel called Statistics from A to Z, Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name, which is published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos, please visit statisticsfromatoz.com. In inferential statistics, we don't have all the data from a population or process, so we perform statistical tests on, sample, on a sample or samples of data. The two main methods of inferential statistics are hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. And there are four statistical concepts which are central to inferential statistics. P, the p-value, alpha, the level of significance, test statistic, and critical value. In the book, there are individual articles on each of these four concepts, and I plan to do individual videos on them as, as well. This is the first. There will also be a video on how these four concepts interrelate and work together, which is something I think is lacking in most books and videos. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll start with a list of keys to understanding or KTUs, and then we'll go into detailed explanations of each key. The first key to understanding is, in inferential statistics, P is the probability of an alpha error or false positive. The second KTU is, from sample data, the test statistic value is calculated. This value is plotted on the probability distribution of the test statistic. The value of P, the p-value, is calculated. The p-value is a cumulative probability, the area under the curve beyond the test statistic value. Key to understanding number three. In hypothesis testing, P is compared with alpha to determine the conclusion from an inferential statistics test. If P is less than or equal to alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. If P is greater than alpha, then we fail to reject it. The fourth and final KTU states, the smaller the value of P, the more accurately the sample represents the population or process. And here on one page are the four keys to understanding the concept of P, the p-value. You may want to pause the video here and read them all together. And here is a preview of how P fits in and interrelates with the other three central concepts in inferential statistics. This is the subject of a separate article in the book and a separate video. In inferential statistics, P is the probability of an alpha error. It's probably easier to understand it as a false positive. Other names for alpha error are type 1 error or error of the first kind. Its opposite is a beta error or false negative. An alpha error is the error of seeing something that is not there. It is the error of concluding that there is something, a difference, change, or effect, when in reality there is not. In hypothesis testing, it is the error of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. For example, in a blood test, a positive conclusion means that there is a disease present. If in fact there is not, that would be an alpha error. KTU number two begins by saying that we calculate the value of a test statistic from the sample data. But what is a test statistic? There are far, four commonly used test statistics, Z, T, F, and chi-square. There will be a separate video on test statistics, but briefly, a test statistic has its own probability distribution or distributions. That means that for any value of the test statistic on the horizontal axis, we know its probability. The test statistic Z has the standard normal distribution as its probability distribution. We can see in the diagram that the probability of Z equals 0 is about 0 0.4 or 40%. Likewise, if we knew a probability, we could look up what values of Z have that probability. But point probabilities like this are not that useful. 
More importantly, the distribution of a test statistic gives us cumulative probabilities of a range of values. For example, here we see that the cumulative probability of the range of values of z starting with 1.645 and extending to positive infinity is 5%. This is calculated as the integral, which is the area under the curve from 1.645 to the right. P is one such cumulative probability. Alpha is another, which is why we can compare P to alpha in a statistical test. The second part of KTU number 2 tells us how the p-value is calculated. We take the sample data and we use the appropriate formula for the test statistic to calculate a value for the test statistic from the sample data. In this example, we see that z is calculated to be 1.2. We then plot 1.2 on the horizontal z-axis of the probability distribution of z. This example shows a right-tailed test in which we calculate the cumulative probability of z equals positive 1.2 rightward to infinity. This gives us a cumulative probability of 11.5 percent. This is the p-value. The previous slide showed a one-tailed, right-tailed test. This is the middle example in the table. On the bottom row, we see a left-tailed test in which everything is flipped to the left. And the top row shows a two-tailed test in which the p-value is split in two and with half placed under the left and right tails each. Whether the test is two-tailed or left or right-tailed is dependent on the alternative and null hypothesis. This is explained in the articles and the videos on those two concepts. But very briefly, you can see that the comparison symbol for the alternative hypothesis in the first column points in the direction of the test. This table summarizes what we've learned so far about the relationship between P and the test statistic. First of all, they are two different types of things. P is a cumulative probability and it is pictured as an area under the curve of the distribution of a test statistic. The test statistic, like z, t, f, or chi-square, is a point value. It is a point on a horizontal axis of the test statistic distribution. The test statistic is calculated first, and it becomes the boundary for the area under the curve, which represents p. The value of the test statistic is calculated from sample data. The p-value is calculated as the area under the curve bounded by the test statistic. Keto understanding number three says, in hypothesis testing, p is compared to alpha to determine the conclusion from an inferential statistics test. If p is less than or equal to alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. If p is greater than alpha, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. But what is alpha? There is or will be a separate video on alpha, but briefly, alpha is called the level of significance or the significance level. It is the highest value for p which we are willing to tolerate and still call the result of the test statistically significant. It separates the p-values which indicate a statistically significant difference change or effect from those that don't. If p equals 8, for example, that is greater than alpha equals 5%. So any difference, change, or effect observed from the sample data is not statistically significant. If, on the other hand, p equals 4%, then we do have a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. Where does the value of alpha come from? Alpha is somewhat unique in that it does not come from data and it is not otherwise calculated. The value for alpha is selected by the person performing the test. It is selected in step two of a five-step method explained in the video on hypothesis testing. Alpha is called the level of significance, but it may be easier to understand if we start with a level of confidence. 
how much confidence do we want to have that we are avoiding an alpha false positive error? If we want to be 95% confident, then we would select 100% minus 95%, and that would be 5% as our level of significance alpha. This appears to be the value most commonly selected. Here's a compare and contrast table for P and alpha. First of all, both are the same kind of thing, cumulative probabilities. They are both pictures as areas under the curve of the distribution of the test statistic. As we have already seen, the test statistic value is calculated first and it forms the boundary which defines P. When a value for alpha is selected, it is plotted as a shaded area under the curve and the critical value is calculated to be its boundary. KTU number three states, in hypothesis testing, P is compared with alpha to determine the conclusion to be drawn from the test. If P is less than or equal to alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. Now, there is a separate video on the null hypothesis, which can be a confusing concept itself, but we can usually state the null hypothesis as saying that there is no difference, no change, or no effect. And if P, the probability of an alpha error, is less than alpha, then there is a statistically significant difference. This contradicts the null hypothesis, which says that there is not. So our conclusion from the test is to reject the null hypothesis. If, however, P is calculated to be greater than alpha, this means that there is not a statistically significant difference, change, or effect. That is the same thing that the null hypothesis says. So the conclusion from our test is to agree with the null hypothesis. We don't reject it. More formally, we say that we fail to reject it. This is kind of confusing language, and some experts say that it is okay to say that you accept the null hypothesis instead of failing to reject it. In visualizing the concept of P, it may help to look at graphs of fail to reject and rejection regions. Here we have the standard normal distribution, which is the probability distribution of the test statistic Z. Alpha is a cumulative probability. Its value is selected by the person performing the test. It is plotted as a shaded area under the curve. This example is for a right tail test, so alpha is plotted under the right tail of the curve. This is the rejection region. In the unshaded area outside of alpha is called the fail to reject region. We are going to build a compare and contrast table of the two conclusions from a hypothesis test in order to illustrate the role played by P. The fail to reject region will be in white. The rejection region representing the cumulative probability alpha will be shaded and the cumulative probability P will be the hatched area under the curve. Here we see the hatched area representing P extends from the test statistic value T rightward to infinity. The shaded area representing alpha is smaller, so P is greater than alpha. Note also that P completely fills up the shaded rejection region and it extends into the white unshaded region. This is the fail to reject region. Since P extends into the fail to reject region, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So when P is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Since we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we agree with the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis states that any difference, change, or effect is not statistically significant. The third column illustrates the opposite case. The hatched area representing P is smaller than the shaded area representing alpha. So P is less than alpha. Note that the hatched area representing P fits entirely within the rejection region representing, representing alpha. So we reject the null hypothesis. And since the null hypothesis says that there is not a statistically significant difference change or effect, we conclude that there is. This table also illustrates that comparing P to alpha 
is statistically identical to comparing the test statistic to its critical value. Look at the top row, middle column. We see that the test statistic value t defines the value for p. So given the test statistics distribution, t and p contain the same information. Alpha and the critical value are similarly related. In that case, we start with the value of the cumulative probability alpha, and that gives us the critical value t critical. Both contain the same information. So comparing p to alpha is statistically identical to comparing t to t critical. The middle column shows that if t is less than t critical, then p must be greater than alpha. And the right column shows that if t is greater than t critical, then t must be less than alpha. Rather than comparing p to alpha to come to a conclusion, we can use the p-value alone. We can specify several ranges of p-values, each, with each describing how strong the evidence against an null hypothesis is. Remember, p is the probability of an alpha error, a false positive. It is the probability of concluding that there is a difference change or effect when in reality there is not. This is one example of a scheme for classifying the strength of the data's conclusion about the null hypothesis. Normally, the scheme would just use the description in the middle column, but I added the right column in case it helps clarify things. There have been problems associated with statistical tests in recent years, which the American Statistical Association believes are related to misuse and misinterpretation of p-values. For example, the results of many tests have not been replicable. Very large sample sizes result in effects being called statistically significant when they are too small to be of practical significance. And sometimes testers mischaracterize what the results of their tests really mean. The ASA issued a statement in March 2016. Some points they made are, scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. By itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. And researchers should bring many contextual factors into play to derive scientific inferences. To view the statement, do a web search on ASA statement on p-values. As I said earlier, this is the first of five related videos on four central concepts in inferential statistics and how they work together. Depending on when you view this video, they are or will be available on my YouTube channel. You can view the status of videos completed and planned on the videos page of the book's website. Okay, that's it for our clarification of this confusing concept. If you like this video, please remember to press the thumbs up like button on your screen below. I'll be making more videos of some or most of the 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me that more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website statisticsfromaz.com has a listing of available and planned videos. Now, videos like this one can be very helpful but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an ebook. You can also learn more about those on the website. I'd recommend following my blog at statisticsfromaz.com slash blog. I've got some interesting things there, like a statistics tip of the week series, as well as posts showing that you are not alone if you're confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on the Facebook page statistics from A to Z, and Twitter as at, stat, at stats A to Z. Till next time, I'm looking forward to communicating with you.